Good evening, everyone. Boa noite. Welcome, bem-vindo, to Building Bridges, Angola, a collaborative program which the Old Dominion University asked our nonprofit organization, the Tidewater African Cultural Alliance, to present. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to bringing the Tidewater community together by offering, <clears throat> excuse me, community outreach, community service, educational programming, and cultural arts and events for and on behalf of the motherland Africa. Our vision is solidarity through the celebration of the African diaspora worldwide. And to that end, we are very, very excited and honored to be here to present this program. My name is Rita Adiko Cohen, the founder and executive director of TACA. I was born in Accra, Ghana, West Africa, but tonight I am proud and honored to represent the Republic of Angola. At this time, I would like to ask if Virginia Beach Mayor Bobby Dyer has joined us, as he wanted to give some opening remarks. We had also been, been forewarned because apparently one of his very good friends passed away today and he is on the way to the funeral. So if he is not here, that may be the reason why. So let's get to it. Before we begin this program, we would like to acknowledge and honor the memory of those first Angolans who made the incredible journey from their homeland to the Americas. So I would ask everyone to please join me in a 19 second moment of silence to commemorate the year 1619 when they came and landed at the Port Comfort in what is now present day Hampton, Virginia. Thank you. I believe Mayor Bobby Dyer was unable to make it, or at least I don't see him yet. So we will just continue and carry on with our program. We are now going to have a libation, something that is very important and pivotal to any African event. So please give me one moment as, oh my goodness, Mayor Donnie Tuck of Hampton is here. Fabulous. Well, let me, let me do this then. Mayor Tuck, especially since this is such a significant connection to your city of Hampton, would you please like to say just a few introductory words before we continue? Well, good evening to everyone and to all the participants. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be able to participate. Uh, I do have a council meeting that's going on right now. <laughs> and so I had to step away, but I'd want to at least be here and take in uh, your, your presentation. I had the honor of going up to uh, the Angolan embassy uh, last year with the Tucker family, as we further commemorated the arrival of the first Africans into English colonies back in August, 2019. And so um, I'm just looking forward to uh, the time I can be with you to see your presentation this evening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We truly, truly appreciate you taking the time, not only out of your busy schedule, but out of your council meeting to join us. It means so much to us, to the Angolan Embassy, and as well, of course, to the Tucker family. Thank you. Okay, so now let us proceed with the libation.
Greetings and welcome. My name is Shadra Pittman with the Sankofa Projects and I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here at this event, Building Bridges Angola. Now, before I begin, I must ask the blessing of the elders, wherever you are in this virtual space, do I have your permission to speak? If so, please say yes or ashe, which means, and so it is. Thank you. I begin the program, this ritual, this libation by burning sage. And I know you're in a virtual space. We're not together, but you can see the smoke rising. Sage is in honor of our native ancestors, in honor of those who walked this land before any of us. They walked Turtle Island, which is what they call Earth, before us. So I burn this in honor of them, their contributions to this country, their sacrifices and their blood spilled. In the book of Ani, which is the book of the dead, the Egyptian book of the dead, they tell us to pour libations for your mother and father who are in the valley of the dead. So that is what we shall do. When we pour, we're inviting our ancestors to be with us in this space. So I'm going to call them in the native tongues of Africa. Bom dia du mele ete sen iri aiche saubona hadibati imdemene shimdemene. We pour for the ancestors. We pour for Mother Earth and Father Sky. We pour to the mountains and to the lakes and to the rivers. We pour to the trees and the flowers and the grass that is beneath our feet. We pour to the divine being. We pour to the four directions. We pour to the sun and the moon and the stars. We pour to all the living on this earth. We pour to the mothers and fathers of civilization, to the people of ancient Kemet, to the kingdom of Ndongo. We pour to those who walked by the rivers of Kwanzaa and Lukala. We pour to the Igbo and the Akan and the Hausa and the Bantu, to the Kalongo, to the Mbundu, to Ida B. Wells, we pour. To Queen Nzinga, we pour. To Carter G. Woodson, to Augusta Savage, to Octavia Butler, to Harriet Tubman, to Malcolm X, El Haj, Malik El Shabazz, to James Baldwin, to Langston Hughes, to Audre Lorde, to Zora Neale Hurston, to Shirley Chisholm, Ya Asantewa, Tony K. Bambara, Tony Morrison, Emmett Till. Beloveds, please say the name of one of your beloveds as I am pouring. I'll pour for my father, Carlton Pittman, the Mirabel sisters. We pour for Anthony and Isabella and William and Angelo. Tucker, the first African family. We pour to those who died, those who walked across the Pettus Bridge, those who fought in the Civil War, those who fought in all the wars. We pour for all those who fought for liberation and justice and equality. We ask that they bless us. We ask that they stay with us, that they guide us, that they nurture us, that they be with us for now and forevermore. We pour and we say. Thank you for that. That was from Shadra Pittman of Sankofa Projects. She will be back in a moment, but at this time, we will be showing you a traditional dance brought to us by Mestre Pechu, who is from Angola, but is living in Lisbon, Portugal, along with the help of myself and some other dancers whom you will see in the video. So may I ask that we now see the traditional dance, please? Vamos embora, vai lá se essa aqui dá.
because of times of strife. But the African people are resilient and jubilant in their celebration and honoring of life. So before we can really delve into the present day of Angola, we have to go backwards and see how Angolans came to Virginia. And again, we have Shadra Pittman, of Sankofa projects to guide us on a journey of the Middle Passage. Back to Angola. Angola. I invite you to come with me. Travel with me back to Angola. I invite you to come with me. Travel with me back to Angola. Let's go across the Atlantic Ocean together. Let's travel and traverse over that water and those waves for that bridge that is now our backs. Let us return to the place where it all began. It was August 1619 when the privateer, the White Lion, arrived off of Point Comfort near present-day Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia. Aboard that ship, was a captive cargo of human beings, 20 and odd, they say, Africans from Angola. These 20 individuals were the first Africans to arrive enslaved in new, this new Virginia colony. They had been given names by the Portuguese missionaries, Anthony, Isabella, William, Angela, Francis, Margaret, John, Edward, and many other names which we do not know. These first Africans lived in the Ndongo Kingdom in Angola in West Central Africa, in a lush place, high green plateau near the Atlantic Ocean. The Portuguese 
and their allies, the Mbangala, wage war on the Ndongo Kingdom, which was the most powerful state in the Mbundu region, to gain control and provide Africans for enslavement. However, before they arrived at Point Comfort, there was the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage was the journey that the Africans took from Africa to the various places they were dispersed during the transatlantic enslavement trade. Africans were taken from the interior of the continent down to the coast. They were put into barracoons and castles and holding cells where they were separated from their families, from their loved ones. There were people from warring villages and towns that were in the same space, unable to speak the same language, unable to communicate. They were unaware of what was happening. Imagine the fear, imagine the concern, Imagine the despair that they felt, tightly packed and cramped in these dungeons, awaiting the arrival of the ships. Once the ships arrived, they were taken out of these buildings and they were loaded onto the enslavement ships, poked and prodded like cattle down to the bottom of the ships. It was dark. They were arm to arm, leg to leg, chained next to the person next to them for a voyage that would last five weeks to 12 weeks or longer in the bottom of a ship. Imagine what they must have felt like. Imagine what they were thinking of, their homeland. Legends say that some Africans picked up dirt as they left the continent and put it in their mouths to take it with them because they wanted a piece of their homeland with them. Many Africans did not survive the Middle Passage. There were millions that lost their lives either by being thrown into the water of the Atlantic Ocean or they jumped refusing a life of servitude. Many starved themselves. They chose to starve themselves and not eat. Those who chose not to eat were force-fed. Others succumbed to disease and despair. They say that a school of sharks would follow the enslavement ships waiting for the next morning. It was a horrific journey. According to the United Nations, the Middle Passage, the transatlantic slave trade, was the largest and most inhumane forced migration in history. But we must remember, we must remember what they went through in the same way we remember the other atrocities, the Native American genocide. We remember the concentration camps in Auschwitz. We must remember these Africans. While history remembers the 20 and odd that landed at Point Comfort, these Africans who traversed the Middle Passage and never made it, who died on board the ships, who died by being thrown into the choppy water of the Atlantic Ocean, which became their grave, these are the ones that the world forgets. So I ask you, to remember them, remember this history. Remember that if we are to heal the world, if we are to heal what slavery broke, as Toni Morrison once said, that slavery broke the world in half, that we must remember. We must cross over the bridge from misunderstanding to understanding. We must cross over the bridge from apathy to empathy so we can build a foundation of truth and reconciliation. We do this in remembrance of them. Thank you once again, Shadrit Pittman from Sankofa Projects. I want to show you this 
This is the symbol. This is a wooden sculpture that I brought back with me from my recent trip in Ghana. This is a bird looking backwards for its egg, which represents the future. This is the Adinkra symbol for Sankofa, which means go back and get it or go back and claim it in the Chi language of the Akan people of Ghana. And that is the basis of what we are doing today. In, honor, in order to honor the memory and the present of Angolans in the United States, in Virginia specifically, we must go back, but we will continue to go forward. And to give us more of an insight of the country of Angola, I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you the ambassador from the Republic of Angola to the United States, His Excellency, Excellency Joaquim Espirito do Santo. Dear all, it is with pleasure that uh, we take this opportunity to share with you today one of Africa's great hidden paradises, Angola. Let me thank Tidewater African Cultural Alliance for the invitation to participate in this virtual closing program for Black History Month celebrations organized by Old Dominion University. Let me also express my warm greetings and best wishes for well-being and prosperity to all those present, particularly the mayor. This month takes us back to the history of the first 20 Africans from Angola who arrived in August 1619 at Shields Peak Bay and were taken to Jamestown, Virginia to be sold as merchandise, making, making uh, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade in America 400 years ago. I believe that this month is not only for reflection on the tragic events of a more dramatic period of universal history, but also an opportunity to promote a shared future based on identity, values, and uh, ideals. I also consider this moment as a moment of culture that deserves singular attention because culture contributes to strengthen the relationship between peoples and to boost tourism. We have been honored and pleased to talk to you interactively about the main topic of this Black History Month celebrations. Mr. Adriano Meshinji is the person who will speak on the proposed topic representing the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and the Environment of the Republic of Angola. Mr. Adriano Mishinj was born in Rwanda in 1968. He holds a master's degree in art history and critics from the University of Havana, Cuba. He was a researcher at the National Museum of Anthropology in Rwanda. Since uh, 2003, he has been a member of the International Association uh, of uh, Art Critics. He is currently a member of the Board of Directors of Memorial Dr. Antonio Agostinho Neto. Prior to that, Mr. Adrian Mechinji served as cultural attaché at Angolan embassies in France and uh, Spain. Uh, to conclude, I would like to reaffirm the determination of uh, the government of Angola to create a business environment that favors Angolans and Americans. I'm hopeful that the existing close ties of friendship and cooperation between our two governments will continue to grow in the years ahead, mutually benefiting our countries and the people. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to carefully follow Mr. Adrian Mechinji's presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
And at the outset, allow me to thank the Angolan Embassy in the United States of America, and in particular, Ambassador Joaquim Espiritu Santos for inviting me to this forum at the Old Dominion University in Washington, D.C., to provide a brief narrative of the history, art, and culture of Angola. It is my intention to present the historical elements that allow us to understand the Angola of today, and more particularly the historical, political, artistic, and cultural reasons why our country offers countless business opportunities. It is a country offering virgin natural landscapes that can be explored, a diversified culture, and a joyful people who have a great capacity to overcome challenges and face adversities, as well as a necessary ambition to ensure that Angola takes its rightful place in the world. This is very important today because this is what allows countries to best optimize the opportunities um, that it can offer uh, the world. So I'm going to start sharing my screen with you so that you can accompany It's hard to believe that less than 20 years ago, Angola was a nation at war. In two decades, the country has bounced back as a major oil producer looking to diversify with great potential for tourism. With all its natural beauty, it's a no-brainer, as we'll see in this edition of Business Angola. Our coastal road trip south of the capital, Luanda, takes us first to Miraduro da Lua, Portuguese for moon viewpoint. It looks like a lunar landscape, rising up from the sandy beaches and carved by eons of rain and wind. Next stop, the Kwanzaa River, stretching a thousand kilometers. Here where it spills into the Atlantic, we find the Kwanzaa Lodge, a great spot for fishing and beach combing alike, 90 minutes from the Wanda. So George, what kind of tourists come here? We're getting quite a few international tourists that want to visit Angola. Uh, we also get... Um, uh, get the, weekenders coming out too, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we get uh, the, the, the local residents that come from Luanda, either to spend the weekend or to spend the day. And say I'm an investor or a tourist, what kind of opportunities do we have here across Angola with a 1,600 kilometer coastline? Yeah, from the tourist point of view, uh, we like a hidden gem. Not much is known about Angola. We have the highlands in the center of the country. We have the equatorial forest to the, to the north on the border of the DRC. We have the desert to the south uh, on the border of Namibia. So there's, there's a lot of uh, potential for people to develop uh, and invest in, in Angola. Time for a safari in Kisama National Park, spanning more than 10,000 square kilometers. The Civil War decimated the wildlife here, but the park has been repopulated by an operation called Noah's Ark, with animals shipped from Botswana and South Africa. So this is just part of Kisama National Park. Miguel, tell us what this is. We can see elephants, zebras, uh, giraffes, eland, wildebeest, monkeys. In Kwanzaa and the uh, Kawa River, we can see manatees, uh, we can see crocodiles. Mama, come and you were born here, right in the same region. How does it feel to be in charge here? Being the administrator of, of the park is a very, very uh, advantage. And, and I feel very well. It means more jobs for people. More jobs for many people, many young people. We combine that wildlife safari with a surfing safari nearby at Caboledo, featuring a stretch of coastline filled with intimate resorts, water sports, and more. Paulo Augusto and his family own the resort Carpe Diem. For me, this is one of the most beautiful places uh, for tourism in Angola. Uh, we got surf, we got Kwanzaa River, we got the national park. As an investor, what is so attractive about this region? In my opinion, you should invest here because this place, this area, it's virgin. We need more resorts, we need more service, we need more people investing here. High above the surfing beach are new ecotourism accommodations Augusto built with recycled materials, solar power, and stunning views in this holiday playground in Luanda's backyard. 
Angola diversifying its economy, tourism as one magnet for investment. Of the prehistorical times uh, of Angola, uh, what we see is that in the southwest region of Angola, more specifically in the province of Namib, we find the oldest traces of animal fossils as well as the anthropological presence. We do have fossils and vestiges of life from the Triassic, the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic periods. In this southwest region of Angola, we find uh, these uh, rock paintings uh, that uh, indicate that there was a vestige of life during the periods that I mentioned. And um, it was also due in this territory that we had the Kozan people that lived here. Just like we found rock paintings in the north of Africa, we find similar paintings in this part of Angola. So they're basically rock paintings on rock walls and caves, and they refer to rituals, uh, to, for example, the births and celebrations of different events in life uh, that were painted onto these rocks. And this is very similar to other rock paintings that we find in other parts of the world. So in the same region um, that we today call Angola, we see that uh, there were Khoisan people who lived there. So until the 13th century, this region was inhabited by the Khoisan people. After the, or between the 11th and the 13th century, there was a great migration of the Bantu people, which also settled in this region, which is today called Angola, and that interacted with the Khoisan people. So we've got 10 large ethnic and linguistic groups that have settled in this area. So we've got the Ofambu, the Herero, the Shindonga, the Gangela, the Ovimbundu, the Nyanekuhumbu, the Bakondu, uh, the Amumbundu, the Chokwe, and the Khoisan. These are all people that settled in this territory. And as a result, there was a transculturalization they basically interacted with each other. And so there was a first phase of transculturalization because they basically uh, mixed with each other. And so these are colored people. And then there was a second phase, uh, which took place when the Portuguese colonials arrived in the territory. So it means that first there was a, an interrelation, an interaction between the different tribes and, and ethnic groups that settled in this area. And then there was a second phase in which there was an interaction between all these peoples and the Portuguese colonialists. And then later there's a third phase, which is the phase in which we're living now, in which the Angolan people now interact and there's a transculturalization that happens as a result of the interaction between the Angolan people and the Portuguese as well as other people in the world. <clears throat> So another important aspect um, are all the sovereigns and the kings um, that these tribes had. And um, I'd like to show you some of the artifacts of these people. So I'm going to show you three artifacts of the Avimbundu, one of the Chokwe, and some of the Bakongo. So you can see a statue on the left, we see a mask in the center, and we see a chair on the right. So it's actually a throne of the Chokwe, uh, which was sculpted by these people. And then in terms of the Bakongo artifacts, we've got a neck uh, support, and we've got a statue. The statue is actually a, a statue of magic rituals. And then we've got Ovimbundu artifacts. So once we've got, once again, we've got a statue and we've got a mask. And these were artifacts that basically uh, became discovered in the 20th century. And there were many writers, both national writers and international writers, that referred to these artifacts in their writing. So just to summarize, I spoke about the prehistoric phase. I spoke about the settlement of the Khoisan that inhabited this region. Then I spoke about other Bantu migrations to the area. I spoke about the ethnic groups that came to the area. 
And um, we have an historian, for example, that says that when you have an interaction between all these uh, people, then you land up with transculturalization and you, you land up with a new culture being born due to time constraints. I think that I should immediately go to the last video. So it is a video on contemporary art. So what's interesting is that Paula Nascimento, who is the curator of the Angolan Pavilion, who won uh, the Golden Lion in 2013, uh, is going to be the one guiding us through this tour. And then we'll also be talking to another famous Angolan who's going to talk about the interaction between the North American people and the Angolan people and the new modern era and this new modern way of interacting. So I hope that once you see this video, you will be convinced that the first thing you should do as soon as this pandemic is over is to visit Angola. Art from Africa. For a long time, the exotic or tribal art labels were stuck to everything that came from Africa. Contemporary African art has left colonialism and the utopias of the 1970s behind. Africa today sets the trends that are felt worldwide, and Angolan artists have a share in it. Paula is part of the international art scene. She curated the Angolan Pavilion, which won gold at the Venice Beninale. She knows the Angolan art scene very well. And what moves her? We visited one of her favorite galleries in Luanda. It's a young and, and vibrant uh, scene. You have painters, you have photographers, you have video artists, you have all sorts of media uh, performance. It's, it's a melting pot of, of, of ideas. One of Angola's most famous artists, a pioneer in contemporary art, is preparing a 50 years retrospective here, Antonio Olla. In the middle of the 70s, Angola became independent. Colonialism was the theme of all the un-African artists all over the continent. We are pretty much linked with the idea of oppression in the past, because the colonialism, as you know, um, uh, provoke a cultural retention and it was a long process to restore uh, this uh, identity. History is not forgotten and continues to be a theme in art, but Africa is also part of the globalized world. Art from Africa is recognized as contemporary in content and form. For years nobody are interested in African art, but suddenly in the last uh, decades we are occupying this empty space and we are more respected now than, than we are before. Today, Angolan artists live and work all over the world. This influences their work and at the same time changes the perception of Africa in the world. Conversely, artists come here to work at the place of their origin. Ayana V. Jackson is an American photographer and artist in residence at Luanda. She's become known for her works on African-American identity. We're mentally stuck in the idea of Africa as traditional. We're mentally stuck in Africa as the past, especially with arts, right? So it wasn't until I went there that I realized that, you know, it's, 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 it's in the same web of globalization as anywhere else in the world. Ayana works on her new project with Angolan artists. She transforms herself into mythically inspired incarnations of African women. She's lived and worked in all African art hotspots. For her, Luanda is one of the best African art cities. I wanted to discover really what was going on here. And I found that it was it's a very vibrant scene, lots of artists. They're here and they're amazing. Contemporary art from Africa is at the cutting edge of time. Today, the African art scene inspires the rest of the world. It's a movement that is happening now and I think that this this movement that has been uh, almost a, a, 
a trademark. The art world is global and we are, you know, part of this. Bom, com estes elementos gerais, eu I hope that I have provided you some general um, indications and ideas on the big picture of what is Angola's history, art and culture. And I would like to once again thank my colleagues at the um, embassy and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Adriano Mujinji. That was wonderful very knowledgeable information and uh, very informative and I for one I'm looking forward to visiting Angola as soon as it's possible so I hope you are as well. Remember you can visit angola.org to check out all that the embassy has to offer as far as information. So we're going to have a little bit of a dance and then we will have the Tucker family interview. Before we do that, I would like to read a message from Virginia Beach Mayor Bobby Dyer. He says, apologies for technical difficulties. I applaud you for bringing the past and present together. Be proud of the heritage and people of Angola. And we definitely are. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. And, um, we will now continue with Kuduro, which is a type of contemporary dance that was big in the 90s. It's still well and alive today as part of the Afrobeats genre. And uh, I hope you enjoy. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Vincent Tucker. I'm a descendant of William Tucker, born and baptized in 1624. His parents, Anthony and Isabella, arrived in 1619 on the ship, The White Lion. The name of our organization is the William Tucker 1624 Society. We're based here in Virginia. And we would like to share with you a little history. And I would like to first thank Ocean Lake High School, the Black Student Union, and Tallwood High School, the African Caribbean Club, for your questions. They are great questions, and hopefully I'm able to share uh, my responses and give you answers in a manner that's this applicable to your understanding. Now, we're going back 402 years, so a lot of history um, has been lost. A lot of history has been burned, but we will do the best we can. I first would like to share with you the mission of the William Tucker 1624 Society. The William Tucker 1624 Society conducts research into the life of William Tucker and that of his descendants. As we gain insight into the strength and resilience of Africans who built and populated the United States of America, we document, preserve, and share their narratives. So it is not just William Tucker uh, that we like to know about, but it's also those uh, that arrived on the ship, the White Lion, uh, that were considered the 20 and all. In our research, it's a lot of connecting the dots, and we are able to go back from generation to generation, not only to see how chattel slavery was in America, we can see and learn some of the culture of the behavior of uh, colonialism in other countries particularly Africa. So um, again, thank you and let's get started. Hello, my name is Ariel Walker. I am a sophomore at Tallwood High School. And my question to the Tucker family is, what did William Tucker do while he was working for the captain? And what inspired his parents to name him William Tucker? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question, and we do not have a written record of the lives of the Angolans, Isabella or Antony, beyond the 1624-1625 muster. The documents them as Negro and William, their son, and, as baptized. None of them have last names, and their status is not given, and there is very little information about them compared to others listed in the muster. No date of arrival, no ship, no, no age. It is through oral history that we were told we are descendants of William Tucker. So to the best of our knowledge, based on other documents, it was not uncommon for the child or maybe firstborn male to be named after the slave owner. Hello, my name is Brianna Goodall. I go through Tallwood High School. I'm in grade 12. And my question to the Tucker family is, is any of his belongings displayed anywhere or do you guys have any of his belongings? Thank you. I uh, know to our knowledge, there, there are no belongings. And <clears throat> we have to understand the year 1619, uh, the Angolans were, were captured and enslaved. So they had very little to carry along with them. And whatever belongings, clothing of that nature uh, over the last four year, 400 years certainly would be destroyed by now just by uh, the age of it. Hi, my name is Ayana. I am a senior at Tallwood High School and my question to the family of William Tucker is, are there any documents left about William Tucker himself or maybe even about his parents? The only documents that's left um, in reference to William Tucker is the 1624-25 muster documents that and that he was baptized. Nothing that according to the mustard, he was the first black child baptized in a family of parents. Also the book, uh, The Living and Dead in Virginia, February 16, 1623, 
lists Isabella and Antony in the household of Captain William Tucker. And there's no evidence that William was born at that time. Hi, my name is Ja'Kai Gibson. I am a senior at Tallwood High School. And my question is if William Tucker had a relationship with his parents or were they separated when he was growing up? We can look at um, William having a relationship with his parents because they would have had to nurtured him. So we can only speculate that he had a relationship with his family. Hi, my name is Sierra McKenzie. I go to Tallwood High School and I'm in grade 12. Uh, my question to the Tucker family is, do you know how William Tucker's early life um, was considering that African people were bought to uh, Virginia as indentured servants and not slaves? Well, when we look at how William Tucker's early life was, we know that in 1619, the Angolans did not arrive in the British colony as free individuals. They were captured by the Portuguese to be sold to plantation owners in Veracruz, present-day Mexico. They left the port of Uganda, Uganda in Angola on the San Juan Batista uh, as human cargo. The ship was pirated and the human cargo was split between the white lion and the treasurer. The white lion landed at Point Comfort because the pirates uh, needed supplies and food. Isabella and Antony and 18 other Angolans were sold for food and supplies. Th they were not free. So I certainly would like to uh, thank you for those list of questions. They were very important. They were just great questions of you. And it shows me how much you are interested in history and our culture. And thanks again for those questions. So far, what has been the most memorable part of your journey of learning about your ancestors? Two things I have personally captured. I've captured the perseverance and the ability or, or the strength in family. For um, Antony and Isabella to travel many, many miles across the Atlantic Ocean into a foreign country um, that they could not speak the language. And to know five years later, uh, birth a child, William, it showed that in spite of difficulty and challenges, they were able to stay together as a family. Um, they were forced to do many things that they weren't used to doing. They were forced into labor, but they came with a skill set of agriculture because they knew how to farm. Um, and they were brought here to the to their new world as laborers. So <clears throat> it showed me that uh, our African descendants were hard workers and they were family oriented. So for my family and having a family of entrepreneurs, and we can go back until mid 1800s, um, we have learned that work, hard work pays off. A lot of black Americans unfortunately do not know where they specifically come from due to slavery. What does it mean to you to be able to know about who and where you come from? A great question. Uh, many African Americans do not know, uh, unfortunately, However, there are resources. Uh, you can now have your DNA uh, checked, um, Ancestry.com. And you can also go to African Ancestry to have research done and to show you where you've come from um, and where your ancestors are from. What would you recommend a Black American who wants to know more about their ancestors do to discover their history? Go to Vital Statistics for research to find out dates and times of their loved ones, their birth, and you can begin to connect the dots because it'll also share with you, uh, say for instance, if you're pulling up your mother and father's uh, marriage records, it will show uh, a little information of their parents signing off to that then you can look up their parents. Uh, so which would be your grandparents and go backwards, work backwards on that. 
uh, with the dates and time periods is giving, which would be the date of the marriage or a date of birth, uh, if you're looking at their birth certificates, and it also show where they live. Sometimes you can go to churches or cemeteries or funeral homes for information. Um, go to the census records. That will also help you to research and find out, uh, discover your history. And again, your ancestry.com, family research, and, um, and, and go, go through those processes to help you learn more about who your family is. Are there any historical documents that detail how William's life in America was and his difficulties living here? To my knowledge, there are no documents detailing the Williams' life here in America. Um, but we can go back through resources and writings and history and learn that once he was born and baptized, and, and we know that through the oral history that we are descendants of him because we weren't able to write things down. A lot, in many families, it was always the oral history that went from generation to generation. So, <clears throat> um, but as we look at the lives and research of some of the Europeans, how they live, it will preference or reference us to um, some of those enslaved individuals that they own. And you can find out some of the stories and what was going on during those times. So we do know that um, the early lives they were used to build America and they were forced to do it. Hi, have you guys researched into the lives of Isabella and Anthony and where they were born? If so, can you please share what you discovered? We have found that there are scholars and researchers that discovered that they were born in in Dongo Kingdom in Angola, Africa. So that's known. And my sister Wanda was on a journey with the USA Today newspaper in mid 2019. And not only did she visit the museum there on the coastline in Angola, but she talked to many vis uh, villagers and historians in that area to discover just how did this journey take place. And there she also learned uh, more about our ancestors and the, the land that they were uh, originally came from. So uh, that is research and we're, we're searching for more answers and we want to um, learn as much as we possibly can so we can share with others. Um, so just, Reflecting from where we are today and looking back 400 years, yes, changes have been made, but we have a long ways to go and we have to stay strong. And I'm very proud of our people uh, who have made it to the White House and become president and vice president, even large corporations, but we can't stop. We have to continue to press forward and keep our mind focused and that allow distractions to um, take us away from who we are. We are here with many gifts and talents and we have to utilize those gifts and talents to uh, for the next generation and to make us all a better people. Wow. Who, Mr. Vincent Tucker of the William Tucker 1624 Society, the Tallwood High School African Caribbean Club and the Ocean Lakes High School Black Student Union. Thank you all so much for being such a pivotal part of this presentation. Just from this interview alone, we have literally a, a personified Sankofa. We reached all the way back to 1619 and we were able to connect today the youth in, the, in Virginia Beach with the descendant of the first African-American child in Virginia, born to parents from Angola. If that does not give you chills, I don't know. It certainly does for me. So we are just about done. And I thank you so much for your patience because of technical difficulties. We did have to start later and therefore we're going to end a little later. So I thank you for staying with us. We began 
this entire program with a moment of silence. I would like to end it with a moment of active reflection. I would like for you to go to the chat and put in there how you will personally continue to build the bridge between Angola and Hampton Roads or wherever you may be from this program. And while you do that, I am going to ask Tech if you can please show the Semba video. That is another form of dance from Angola. We have Kizumba, which is a slow partner dance, but Semba is a little more lively. And we have the owner of the Mambo Room a Dance Studio and Cultural Center located in Norfolk, Virginia. Her name is Kianda, and she has been to Angola. She is responsible for everything I am wearing. And she has done so, so much to help us in preparing for this presentation. So I have to thank her as well. And of course, I have to thank the embassy. I have to thank the schools, the Virginia Beach public school system for allowing us to do this. The Tucker family, um, so many people, Mayor Tuck of Hampton, Mayor Bobby, Donnie Tuck of Hampton, Bobby Dyer of Virginia Beach, Old Dominion University for giving us the opportunity and platform to present this. And of course, you for coming and taking advantage and to become culturally more aware of what has happened and is happening in the state of Virginia. I also have to thank Mr. Pichu for his beautiful dancing and all of the other dancers who were included in the dance videos. Last but not least, because we're just going to be chatting and, and watching dancing after this, I have to let you know, if you are not aware, that Port Comfort in Hampton, where the 20 odd Angolans were dropped off in 1619, is now going to be part of one, it's going to be one of 50 memory routes as part of the slave route of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we literally, I think we have known, we've always been a part of history, but now it is being acknowledged, not only in the United States, but worldwide. So please take to the chat, please write how you will continue to build the bridge that we have begun today, and then watch some Semba dancing from Kianda and Stefan from the Mambo Room.
And there you have it. I hope you have been very, very busy in the chat. And uh, last but not least, oh, I see a few things here. Uh, please continue to put in how you will personally continue to build the bridge. Um, definitely, I want to thank Gilles Inglis. I don't know if he's here, but he is the one who made the liaison between Taka and the embassy possible. And so much of what you saw tonight would not have been possible without his assistance. Um, Lisa Clark from the Old Dominion University who initially reached out to me for this. My amazing board, some of them who are here, um, just everything. For me personally, having worked on this project, it was so emotional and so enriching and I have learned so much and I hope you have as well. Um, if I have left anyone out, please, I apologize. Uh, it, it's not intentional. Definitely Shadra Pittman. I just realized I did not thank you. I already did, but I'm going to add that. From Sankofa Projects, the libation and the Middle Passage, fabulous. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Let's continue to honor who we were by being the best that we can be now that we have the opportunity. Please visit taka757.org to see everything else that we are up to. We have won some grants and we're excited to do more with and in our community. So once again, thank you, thank you so much, everybody in attendance. You will receive a follow-up email and uh, with more information and I, I really don't have anything else to say except muito obrigado. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's tuapanduna, which is thank you in umbundo. Okay, I hope I said that correctly and well. It's difficult for me to read without my glasses, but I did the best I could. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Please um, have a great evening, and we look forward to the next time we can come together to celebrate our wonderful Mother Africa. Thank you.